into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. Song War Dogs. No, this. <laughs> What's Ozzy Osbourne's? You've surprised me so much with this comment. <laughs> Wait a minute, but you don't know either. Ozzy Osbourne's band, Black Sabbath. War Pigs. I'm going. Oh, Black That's a Pink Floyd song. I thought. Fuck, you're right. It's War Pigs. I w- I thought this it was cannot dogs. be the start of the episode. <laughs> oh, it's good. We got a thing going here. I thought it was going to be Dogs of War. I thought there was a song called Dogs of War, so I was going to change it to Frogs of War. Oh, my God. About the Navy SEALs who somehow became SEALs. They evolved into SEALs after being frogs. Isn't that weird? Yeah, Dogs and of War their is... symbol is a trident, which neither SEALs nor frogs make use of. That's something I have, I'm kind of a stickler with. That's fucking Dogs of War. Weird. Dogs of War is a Christopher Walken movie which I used to uh, look at longingly as a boy uh, that I was not able to rent. Um, but it, it always looked cool. I should probably, I can watch it now. I could get away with that, but you're a grown man. You can do whatever yeah. you want. You can watch rated PG 13 movies from the nineties about war drama. You can see the side of a breast. These frogs. Side you gotta do something about <laughs> frogs. Of out of control. <laughs> Hello. I Welcome just googled going ribbit like a frog of war. That's said crazy it was Black Sabbath, Man, right? I am okay. going nuts right now. <laughs> that was so far away from the original premise. I love it. Hello, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do walking and I turned into like Harvey Firestein. That was weird. Welcome to the podcast today. Pod what is damn America? Why would you pod damn America? What's this, is this even in reference to? Well, who am I becoming? I just turned it into Walken? Nick. What would you guys guess well, Christopher Walken's guys. ethnicity is? Why? We didn't Italian? even say our names. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I also say, I would say German. Hmm. Interesting guess, Jake. I said Italian because he's in all those mob movies. He is German Scottish from downtown in like former president Trump is from Queens. It's very strange. They're both German Scots and are from Queens. I he looks German. Yeah, you could s- picture him like in the Nazi get up. He would yeah. look like a scary Nazi. If we didn't know that he talked like that, he'd be very menacing. It's his wide right, forehead. You can't he slip get a crowd past. past me. He, he gets cast as Italian quite often. Sometimes they do a little bronzer, like in True Romance, but I think that's just because of his accent. The Queen's thing. But, and uh, I'm yeah. Alex Patak. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm Jake Flores. That's Alex Patak. Hey. Anders Lee is here. Anders Lee here. I'm trying hey. to think of some language to say hello but i'm drawing a blank a german fool you've been talking about german I yeah i don't know how to say hello in german i'm sorry guten tag Go, oh right right i only know one word i took german for two years and i only l- learned one word what was that house of goblin which that means that? homework which i did not do in the yeah. class but Andrew's one of those motherfucks who learns the word homework in every language god damn yeah, you know what I'm saying? This so man can, loves homework. So What's can, the deal with it? You're not working on your home, as Jerry Seinfeld once asked to an audience of kids. Another proud New York native. He was talking to his girlfriend. Wait. Oh! <laughs> Ew! <laughs> you can oh. pedophile, folks. I haven't heard Christopher Walken's voice in so long, and I think I used to be able to do it, and it's really upsetting me that I can't do it right now. There was a comedian in Austin who did a one-word Christopher Walken impression. It was pretty funny. It was just, come on! Come on! Come on! Come on. I can't do it. I can't make he it. Was, 
he was the celebrity to impersonate when I was like two years old. Like no one has been referencing Christopher Walken for decades. <laughs> I don't know about that one. You know, he's kind of hacky at this point to do it, but it's still funny. Like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, don't do it on stage. He has a naturally funny voice. Yes. It's a Queens thing. Just like former President Trump. It's a Queens thing. It's they just Queens produce thing. impressionable impression, not impressionable, but impression uh, inspiring individuals that burrow. Uh, just to round out the conversation, I Googled Dogs of War song. And the top yes. result I got was by Blues Saraceno. The band we all know and love. This will work. Blues yeah, I'm going to be Sarasano. slipping this into the, the episode. Saraceno? Yeah, where's that from? Uh, I think he's... Uh, it's 2014. It could be like a rap thing. Blues Stars. Stars. Blue. I got the SARS blues because this pandemic's been going on for too long. Never <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell you about my Queens is weird thing that happened to me. I, I think was, I saw it, but do, do go on. I for the listener, if you don't know why I tweet about Queens being weird all the time, it was like five in the morning, and I was on the way my way to catch a flight, and I was uh, like getting out of the subway or something in Queens. And I took a picture rather idly of like a weird looking building. Like it was weird because it was on like a three way intersection or something. It's like a triangle building. And I wrote Queens is weird. And then I like got on the plane and got off of it and have been like retweeted like a thousand times by people that were like doing the dunk thing that you do on Twitter. They're like this misogynist patriarchal <laughs> you know oh because the queen is a woman i see i know it wasn't i mean I'm ju- i thought it was like brooklyn chauvinism they it were was like, more it's- like it's like dumbass podcast people I, i'm just kidding about the misogyny but it was more like the take was like oh the you're privileged and you live in Brooklyn, but you come out to the working man's Queens and you think it's weird. You're calling <laughs> the proletarian weird. Yeah. Queens has such a bone to pick with the rest of this city. I do not understand it. Home of, yeah, proletarian, famous proletarian, Donald J. Trump. Right. Queens, New York. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard Christopher Walken. Yeah. I mean, I think he actually uh, grew up scrappy, but. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of it's different from Brooklyn, but it I think has more or less the same demographics. There's a a petite bourgeoisie in Queens. There's a working class in Queens. It's you know maybe not as gentrified and developed as Brooklyn, but okay. Still but you got to admit, there. you got to admit though, it's weird. It's a weird place. It's where Donald Trump and Christopher Walken are from. Yeah. <laughs> Weird central, man. Spider-Man is somehow supposed to be from there, but is only ever seen in Manhattan. How does that work? Buildings yeah. aren't tall enough in Queens, except for Long Island City. Do you ever see Spider-Man there? You must. Yeah, he no, probably does. He, there's like banks he goes to. <laughs> he travels by slinging himself like a spider connecting to tall buildings, which only works in Manhattan because there's tall buildings everywhere. You can't get to Manhattan by being like standing in Queens and then go right. like, oh, look at the skyline and then shoot a thing. So he has to, what's weird about Spider-Man is that he has to just take the subway to get there. And then he yeah. starts doing all the crazy stuff or whatever. Yeah, that's, you know, I used to, fan when I moved to St. Paul, I used to fantasize about what, different superheroes that could be there and options are very limited if you're spider-man you have you know a five mile radius in downtown st paul just like a few tall buildings and that that's it there's got to be crime happening right there or you're useless that's why it's a hard city spider-man would be useless in st paul in washington dc he'd be super fucked because they're not allowed to have tall buildings right the building could be taller than the capital or whatever so honestly is that just anti-Spider-Man discrimination law? He could go. See, uh, Arlington has a few little patches, Roslyn, Crystal City, where there are built like actual. It looks like an actual city, but the streets are like empty. It's like a ghost town. Uh, but they have these tall buildings where they put like Deloitte 
and shit like that. Um, so Spider-Man could be hanging out there and catching real criminals because that's where most of the crime happens in the country. Probably is in like Rosalind or in Arlington. I, if I was Spider-Man, I'd fucking move to Dubai. Because like every other day on Instagram, I see some shit that's like Dubai build the world's tallest phone booth. And it's like mm. hundreds of feet tall or some shit. Yeah, mm-hmm. that would let him reach a new level that he hasn't been able to in New York. I was just thinking like emergency meeting at Marvel. We need a new city for Spider-Man. Spider-Man's definitely moving somewhere in China. He's moving yeah. to a city in Japan, uh, like dense industrial areas with like overdeveloped like small metropolitan areas like i don't think i mean and he could think of all the trains he could take in china now their high-speed rail in the last 12 years my god he could fight crime anywhere yeah i mean i don't think the train people who operate the trains love spider-man like hopping on top of them and stuff but that's the question right yeah he does but it's also kind of a nuisance in a way and this really goes to i think maybe the difference between dc and marvel is if you're in spider-man's route is that like a a premium does that put a A priority real estate yeah well because in metropolis if the skyscraper penthouses um are extra expensive if they include space where superman flies by so that's like a part an incentive to get one of these apartments Maybe it's a shitty apartment, but it's way up high and you get to see Superman just a few feet away from you flying around. Is the same thing true of Spider-Man in New York City? Is Do people see him as a nuisance, which is generally the attitude towards superheroes in the Marvel Universe? Or do people want a, a sighting? Do they want da- daily regular sightings of Spider-Man sw- doing his thing? I think it would be correct to identify him as a nuisance because usually wherever he shows up, there is more destruction than a Spider-Man free zone. Yeah, but like, you know, as Alan Moore pointed out in The Watchmen, the superheroes are essentially like fascist, paramilitary, private, weird vigilante people. So like it, a neighborhood, rich people would like Spider-Man because they would be able to be like, our gated community is Carol Gardens is protected by Spider-Man. And... <laughs> So we get to push our strollers down the street and take our children to school knowing Spider-Man's out there. And then meanwhile, like poor people would hate Spider-Man because he'd be like, I mean, he beats them up and stuff, you know, and he like he's sticking them the walls. Yeah. (laughs) So he's just like the cops. Well, I guess. But he's like a privatized thing. He's like Blackwater or something. Yeah, I tend to think Superman kind of is. The exception to that in some ways is his main enemy is a war profiteer. So I think he's and, you know, we've well, been through this, but historically he fought like slum lords and stuff back in the uh, New Deal era. Superman, you were explaining the real estate value Superman brings, but I think that's kind of silly in a way specifically for him. He's the guy who flies up to space just to listen around the world like he can get anywhere instantly. He doesn't need a subway at any point. True, but his main haunts are in Metropolis. Everywhere which... is convenient to Superman, is my point. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, there's a lot in the news uh, this week, and um, uh, <laughs> it's it's tough out there, people. <laughs> what is the JLA, Justice League of America, which, frankly, kind of a chauvinist name, if they're supposed to be protecting not only Earth, but the universe, they're called the JLA and not JL, you know, U or something. Um, but what what would their position be on the Ukraine situation? The Justice League of America sounds like a dark money think tank or like a fucking thing that platforms Ben Shapiro and puts them all over Facebook or something. I would uh, argue just from the name Justice League of America, you're essentially just getting superhero NATO. So they are um, immediately going in and you know, first striking into Russia at this point. There's a lot of uh, 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 tension on the border between Ukraine and Russia right now. What if you had, I don't know, a flyby by Green Lantern? There's been all this talk about false flags this week. What if, you know, a giant bucket poured lava (laughs) onto one side of it? It would be pretty easy to see who did that. Yeah, I think the... Green Lantern would probably just put a border around Ukraine. That would be 
possible for the Russians to cross. <laughs> I mean, which would continue to tank their economy, which is the main thing <laughs> happening this week. Right. <laughs> the Wonder Good. Twins. What about the kid that turns into a bucket of water? Could he help the situation? Uh, where there's drought, maybe. Drink me, please. <laughs> oh, not all of me. Oh no, now I'm Ukrainian piss. I mean, we did uh, we did read Red Sun, which brings up an interesting set of circumstances. Would um, I mean, depending on how far back you go, there probably would still be a Soviet Union if they had a super. Okay, you're but, you're uh, somehow stumbling into my main uh, uh, gripe with the current discourse around the Ukraine crisis, which is America at large does not like I identify Russia. Like we think the Soviet Union is still around collectively mm. and that we are still going to beat it, despite the fact it is not a country anymore. And uh, yeah. it does. It's just like a hollowed out shell of the thing that used to be that thing. We're determined to like get in there and kick their ass. Despite the fact that we could all become like shadows on a wall tomorrow if two nuclear powers get in a fight. <laughs> it's crazy because like we went in and liberalized all this shit after the Soviet Union fell, but then like old ladies are just still like, Comrade Mitch, are you trying to do Marxism to us? Yeah. <laughs> With your bears? Yes, and your ice picks. I don't know, man. You know what's crazy? I had a uh, I did fifty first jokes last night, and the, the last time it happened was two years ago because there was like an off year, and I did that one too. And the one two years ago was uh, it was the, I remember my material. It was like right as the Iran stuff was happening, and Trump had killed that uh. Soleimani guy. And so I remember I did a joke about how we're going to go to war with Iran like tomorrow. And this is how you found out about it or whatever it was the joke because I was yelling at the audience like this is how you found out World War Three is going to happen. And uh, I almost did the same fucking joke last night because I was like, hmm. yeah, is World War Three going to happen this time? But I guess that's got me thinking. You know, it's whenever stuff like this is happening, it's so fucking like scary and the stakes are so high that we have to like kind of go through every angle of it and freak out and stuff. And is so I guess what I'm wondering is like in a few weeks, is this just going to be like that where we all fucking forget who Soleimani is and all this shit. And, uh, I know, really just, hope so. Yeah. Here's hoping. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if you asked me last week, I would have said yes. Cause it seemed like it ended. And then they were like, just kidding. It's worse than ever. We're They're definitely doing the word it. war like a lot right now. It's really freaky. The president is saying like they're yeah. about to invade and we're going to war. And it's like you're in charge of it. Oh, no. I I'm just like reading that. now. <laughs> apparently, the just as you're speaking, the battleship Maine was sunk on the Black Sea <laughs> by the Rus <laughs> by the Spaniards and the Russians. I guess it's strange. But uh, I think the we should take more of Mexico. <laughs> I think the reason it's uh, being prolonged so much is because this really is a a game of of chicken. And I think I feel confident in saying there is not going to be a full scale invasion of like Kiev, which uh, the White House is saying is going to, to happen. There could be. I mean, we we're talking about the Soviet Union earlier and a lot of these states, you know, uh, in regions like I don't I think it's. I don't remember how it's pronounced other than it's close to dumbass, that region of uh, Ukraine. Donbass? Donbass, yeah. How hard is they, that? Come on. I mean, it sounds close to the other one. You're ones, on so television. There. <laughs> right, that's where uh, a lot of my viewership is. And they, I don't know why, identify as Russian. A lot of them are separatists. They want to be part of Russia because at one point they were. They were in the Soviet Union. There's another, There are other countries as well where that's, the case where a lot of the people there want to be in Russia. They, they think of themselves as Russian, not, not defending that, uh, <laughs> you know, vantage point, but, but you know what they, I would say is Donbass is weird, man. Yeah. Donbass. <laughs> it's Donbass. like the Queens of Ukraine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Crazy out there. But like, so it is possible. And there are troops, I guess, in, in dumb Donbass, uh, Russian troops, and they, there could be a little skirmish there, but, 
there is not going to be an invasion of Kiev. But the fact that Biden is saying that there will be makes him look good for when there inevitably is not. So when Putin does not invade Kiev, when we finally it's just too clear that that's not going to happen, Biden will be able to take credit for it. Because right now he's trying to make up for Afghanistan, which the intelligence community and the you know Washington consensus is still pissed at him about. So right. he's going to be a tough guy here in in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and Putin, you know, wants kind of the same thing. He wants to spin it as a victory for him as well. So it's just kind of this like you know uh, aesthetic ship that makes so much sense, but like. Could they accidentally just fucking start a war while they're having a pissing match with each other? And then, absolutely, you know, they d- could. kill us first because we're in fucking New York. <laughs> it Am could I happen. I wouldn't rule that out, but I don't think Putin, <laughs> like he knows he's not going to win, right? And this is what, like, when people are talking about, oh, or you're you're carrying water for Russian imperialism or the Russian war machine. Like, I have issues with things that. The Russian government does, but can you really call them an empire if we're comparing them? If you know, speaking as an American, are we really going to say that that's in any way comparable to the capacity, the presence that the U.S. military has? Like, it's just kind of absurd. Uh, and I think he is shrewd enough to recognize that and is not going to fight a war that he knows he's going to lose and lose badly. Yeah, I mean, you're right, but it is also such a thing as, like, if you're Russia and you are existing alongside the sprawling behemoth of the American empire, which has a gun in everyone's faces around the world entirely, and you want to do anything ever in terms of your own sovereignty and trade and control over your own area that where you're the biggest uh, fish in the pond, you do probably have to do a display of strength at some point. Yeah. Uh, which they have not been able to do since we like sent private corporations in to gut their economy 30 years ago. Uh, And it's like, if it doesn't happen now, it's going to happen eventually. This this, like fantasy America has been living in since 1950, where we can just uh, uh, coercively be in control of the entire world is going to fall apart at some point. And I don't think anybody could tell you necessarily what's going to happen now because the situation is spiraling so fast in so many different directions. Like, this could just diffuse tomorrow. But the thing that's really bothering me Hopefully. is seeing how game all of the media at home is for just, like, fuck it. We're back in the saddle. Everybody's going to war again. We found a new bad guy. Stop talking about COVID. Stop talking about Democrats. Uh, stop talking well, about you- how in debt you are. The thing where you go to war to save your like your your uh, polling numbers or whatever is totally real and is yeah. historically you know precedented and everything. But there's also just this crazy shit where like to, uh, to me it's like mind bending to look at in terms of the way like liberals talked about Trump being like a the guy who's going to get us all killed with the oh my god he's got a finger on the button the nuclear launch buttons but also they were like mad because he liked russia too much it's like is this like a good this is somehow it's the opposite you got the same shit is happening i don't know so it's so fucking weird and and schizophrenic like you gotta nuke the world the right way jake (laughs) <laughs> People are so mad at like the weird fucking Trump, like uh, puffed up, you know, Trump Putin stuff that they're like, we did it. We defeated this evil president by like electing a, a guy who's going to get us all nuked in a war with Russia because Russia bad or whatever. I think right, everyone just like- forgot about nukes because like there should just be a, a general higher, higher level of tension about that. There was a there whole cold war about it. It's like, what, you can't just go back from cold to hot. You can't go from cold to hot. You can't go from cold to hot. <laughs> what should have Why been? Why they call it homework? <laughs> <laughs> You're not working on your homeland. But like the Cuban Missile Crisis should have been the moment where we're like, what the fuck are we doing? Like Miami almost got just wiped off the map. Like there was an order for a Soviet this submarine guy to. to- solving everything and it didn't happen 
I mean, maybe that's what it would have taken is for us to actually reap a little bit of what we're sowing. Um, they call it Donbass, but I just hear dumbass. <laughs> is the dumbass region? <laughs> well, like that would have been the time to, to de-escalate or after the fucking Cold War. There's so many times where we could have done this. You know, nobody. I feel like all just about everybody tacitly accepts that we need to denuclearize the, the world. And obviously we're not going to do that unilaterally, but like, this is not, this is not moving the ball in the right direction there. You know what we need to do actually right now is have an emergency podcast about the Ukraine Russia situation where we talk about star Wars. There's a new show called the book of Boba Fett out. We could watch that. Mm and then just talk about it instead of Ukraine and make our listeners like us even more than they already do. Only if there can be seven of us who are all like too high to be on mic <laughs> at the same yes. time. I was so <laughs> angry at Blake Midget. <laughs> oh, that was two fucking years ago. You guys remember that? Uh, I, was, I don't think I was on that episode. It was, but it was... I don't think uh, either of us were. As... It was weird because... Um, Jeremy and Bryn were both on it, and I was like doing something yeah. else, and I was like, "My whole other podcast is on my podcast today." <laughs> oh yeah, you guys weren't on that. <laughs> just, <laughs> just as a refresher, uh, we the, during the Iran, um, you know, almost total war situation, we released a, a an emergency Iran podcast that was just us. That was them talking about the new Star Wars, right? That's what we're referring to. If you had yeah. started listening to the show since then and not, you know, you weren't around for the Iran thing. We ever, our own listeners got very mad at us, which is you, a lot of you. Thank you for still listening. Thank you for um, still listening. And also <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, it was a dick move. I'm, I know, but we didn't have enough time to learn about the entire situation. Over, We're three dumbasses. It's from really Dumbass. a titling error. If you think about it, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we did it eventually. Yeah, you were, you were there. You remember we did a good this job. is the clips episode of Pod Damn America. You remember that one time this thing happened? <laughs> Here's the thing. Well, uh, we're we're gonna speaking of war. Wait, I got I got a good one. Okay, I have an Anders level segue. Well, it's times like this, Jake and Anders, that I I wish the heroes from the Justice League of America were real, like Superman oh. and all their friends. Uh-huh. But instead. It seems like we're stuck with America's heroes. And by that, of course, I mean the brave Navy SEALs who work Boom. undercover protecting us day and night. Or do they? Or do they're they? They're mighty trident. And also they wear a trident and they're like frogs. Yeah, but they're also SEALs. Thank you, Sea Frog Merman, for saving the day once again by setting up bombs underwater. Thank you. Arf, arf. Arf, arf. <laughs> arf, arf, we're back. Uh, that's the sound of a seal barking. Hello. Uh, let's move now into our interview. We are speaking today with Matthew Cole, investigative reporter at The Intercept and author of this new book, Code Over Country. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm very excited. Uh, very excited uh, as well. Um, so let's talk about your book uh, right off the bat. Why did you write this book? Well, um, you know, for the money, of course, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, oh, I've been working for, for uh, the better part of a decade on um, issues related to seal team six in particular uh, war crimes, um, criminal activity, cover-ups. Um, and I had done a story a big feature uh, for The Intercept in 2017. Um, unfortunately, the day we published, January 10th of 2017, was the day that CNN broke uh, the news of the existence of the Steele dossier. And mm -hmm. so the story ran into sort of the buzzsaw of um, Trump, the Trump administration, the incoming Trump administration and Trump Russia. And, um, you know, after I, that story was 14,000 words, there's a lot of that story is in the book. Um, but I didn't think the story was over. There was more to it. Um, there was a, uh, I thought a, I mean, 
I'm more to the point, people on the inside, SEALs, people in the SEAL Team 6 community felt that Congress, the Pentagon, the civilian government um, did not get or understand how bad the corruption was within um, the Navy SEAL community and SEAL Team 6 in particular. And so, um, you know, you, I just thought there was more room there, more space. So that's the 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 long-winded answer. Totally. Okay. Well, there's a lot in that that I think we'll work our way up to um, because that is this is an interesting and fascinating look at the culture of corruption in the Navy SEALs. Who would have thought? So uh, before we get to that, though, I want to start way back at the beginning. Please tell me about the Frogmen and the origins <laughs> of what becomes SEAL Team 6. Sure. Um, Frogmen and what would later become the underwater demolition teams, the UDT, uh, came in uh, World War II um, as the Navy was delivering Marines uh, in uh, onto islands and beaches uh, in the South Pacific, but also um, in Europe, Normandy, for instance. Um, <clears throat> the Navy didn't have a way of scouting um, underwater to understand what the depths, uh, uh, the tides were, what the water looked like as a, in terms of surveying like basic topography. Um, and there was a particular um, uh, battle and invasion um, in a, a small atoll um, in the South Pacific um, that where they uh, missed, they misunderstood the tide um, by essentially by a day. And in doing so, they they delivered all of these Marines um, into uh, the coral that sat before the beach. And uh, they got wiped out by Japanese snipers um, and they, an entrenched Japanese position on the island itself. And so although they ended up winning and taking the, the, the atoll, um, the what the Navy understood was that they didn't have uh, what they needed to get in there and make sure that the landings went well. And so what they did was they recruited men who could handle, could do two things. I mean, they, there were a mix of, of units. There wasn't just one. There were about four going on simultaneously. But the two main skills were the ability to swim and do survey measurements um, underneath the water and to uh, use explosives underwater to blow up impediments. So, you know, you might have to stuff um, dynamite into a coral to blow it out so that there's space for um, the the delivery vehicles to to move. And so what what developed was this culture, the, the guys that they were men that they were recruiting were considered within the Navy and for obvious reasons, they were the crazy bastards. They literally um, showed up on a ship, and they got they they went into the water with very little other than a swimsuit, sometimes just you know essentially a, a speedo and some fins, and some specialty equipment like um, uh, uh, graphite that they and a, a chart so they could mark in the water what the distance and, and depths were um, when they were studying and or using um, uh, being able to set uh, explosives in the water. Uh, and then swim back. And so, and to do so at night, in the middle of the night, um, you know, within a couple hundred yards of uh, land, which was entrenched, usually had, you know, an enemy position. So this, these were, these guys had no protection. They had no safety. Um, it, it was dangerous. It was dangerous work. And if you, you know, didn't do the timing right, or you mishandled the explos the explosives, boom. Um, so it wasn't for, you know, it wasn't everyone's cup of tea. And so, that from there um, into after World War II, they sort of shrunk them and then um, they got into the Korean War and the UDT, uh, the underwater demo team, uh, expanded uh, again and they started working on uh, delivering men, not just for surveys, but also going into land and essentially starting to do what, you know, commando raids, going in and gathering intelligence inland, uh, blowing things up and then coming back. And so that that's your 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 origin story. And then uh, in 1960, 61, with Kennedy and the uh, uh, growing U.S. presence in Vietnam, there was Kennedy called for and ordered a, uh, you know, essentially an increase in special forces. And among those were for 
the Navy commandos. And that gave us the what we now know as SEALs, uh, sea, air, land, um, because it, uh. it, it defines what um, where they can insert from and what their exer- expertise are. So in the other services, you have got you have services that do special forces as well, and they can do um, air and land, but they don't do water. And so because they were from the Navy, that was one of the primary things. SEALs have the ability to do all three, which makes them unique. Important interjection. If they do sea, air, and land, they should be SALs. Um, yes, except that um, they like the SEAL. And so it was the SE from C and the A oh. for air and L for land. So that's a, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's what they stuck with. It do seems they convenient. <laughs> they, they also do snow. I, you know, I okay. suppose that these guys would argue between the, between the services who does snow better. But yes, they do do <laughs> snow. You could argue that their uh, concept is a little bit flimsy, but we all enjoy a seal, so we'll just go with it. Yeah, understandable. It's more of an anagram. It's like my well, and you know the thing is, is that they is that they're they're it's it's confusing because they're seals, but actually the UDT and the, the guys who were the predecessors to the seals were known as frogmen. Right. And still very much a tradition within the seals is that you're a real frogman, and uh, so. You know, there's no, it's, it's, there's no, um, there's no doctrine here. It's, it's, they've sort of, you know, take it as they, as they wish. When they make love, it's called yiffing. All right, moving on. Um, okay. Those are scalies, actually, not furries. Don't get it confused, internet people. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so we've moved, okay, from frogmen through the UDT up to when we get into actually forming the, the Navy SEALs. SEAL Team 6, though, if I'm correct, comes from this guy, Commander Richard Marcinko. Can you tell me about him and how this turned into a special group within the Navy SEALs? Right. So all of um, what we now know as the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, which was the predominant hunter killers uh, and manhunters after 9-11, which include... SEAL Team 6 and the Army's version, which is Delta, Delta Force, um, they came about essentially after the failure um, in 1980 to get uh, hostages, uh, American hostages out of Tehran, being held in Tehran. Uh, There was a uh, special operations that uh, a new unit called Delta was uh, tried to conduct and in a place that ended up being what was called the disaster at uh, Desert One, which was a location in inside Iran. And um, after its failure, the Carter administration authorized the Pentagon to come up with essentially building a more robust commando system for hostage rescue and for counterterrorism. Um, a then uh, lieutenant commander Richard, known as Demo Dick Marcinko, who was a Vietnam veteran, uh, highly decorated silver star. I think he had two bronze stars. Um, pushed the idea of this counterterrorism, an elite counterterrorism unit for the navies that the navy that would have seals, uh, because no seals were involved in the um, effort to the, the uh, Desert One uh, disaster, um, and so the navy authorized uh, in quick. Uh, measure this new unit. And Marcinko created it very quickly. Um, he got it up within, got it up and running basically within six months. Um, and it uh, was then, it still remains the uh, Navy and Navy Special Warfare's, uh, you know, top unit um, that is essentially always on standby. The problem is, is that Marcinko as a person, he's He just died, uh, I think, at the age of 81 on Christmas, this past Christmas. And he, um, in his, the obituaries were often describe him as colorful, which is about as nice a thing as you can say about uh, someone who's just died. He was, um, he was very smart, quite cunning and savvy. Um, He was uh, also a inveterate liar. Um, He was a convicted felon uh, and he was a criminal. Uh, through and through, he also ran, and uh, I think my book has uh, probably the the only and the last interviews with him on the record before he died, um, discussing the origins of the unit and what he had some acknowledgement about, because of what I was trying to understand, and I think 
I, I hope I accomplished in the book is that SEAL Team 6 was created with his DNA and it was done in his image. And so all the things that were, um, were special and unique about him, the good side, it has. All the things that were special about him that were bad um, and, and tended to be you know, sociopathic um, also were in the unit. And so you know, at one point he said to me, you know, uh, it occurred to me, you know, he was saying this uh, sort of as an older person, he said that it occurred to him very late in life that he said, if, if, um, if I was fucked up, then the unit was fucked up. Well, he, he measured guys by their ability to drink gin with him. That was sort of the way people got in and out of the unit was, and, and, and he said explicitly, I created it as a mafioso. I was the godfather. We kept everything in-house and that was the way it had to run. And there was, I think in 1980, 1981, 1982, there, there was some good reason for that at the time. Um, but he ended up going to prison and being convicted for, uh, essentially a, a kickback scheme in which he was using seal team six. He was no longer at seal team six, but he used their, um, procurement and contract system to order a bunch of, uh, dud grenades and then take the money that was a padded contract and, and split it with someone else so that he had a, a, a little nest egg when he retired. Um, and, and in very used, colorful in, move, very colorful. colorful move. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, it, he, he was, like I said, very savvy and very smart. Um, he had a, I think, um, you know, he probably was a sociopath. Um, and he certainly believed that he had more runway than he was given. And he took as much, you know, he, he sort of was of the, and the seals in general are of the, you know, um, rather than, you know, beg for forgiveness, forgiveness, rather than, you know, ask for permission. Um, and that's sort of a, uh, you know, there's another one, which is, you know, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Um, did he also write though, like the, the, I can't remember what exactly the language is for this, but there was like a, like a mission statement or like a man of whatever. No, no, the, no. The, the Navy ethos written later by others. Okay. He, he wrote, uh, you know, what people may know about Marcinko is, is that after he uh, went to prison, he needed to pay off his, his legal bills and he needed to sort of uh, save his image. So he wrote a book, a memoir called Rogue Warrior. And Rogue Warrior became a huge rec recruiting tool for the SEALs and for SEAL Team 6 in particular with a younger generation. Um, it also created a blueprint for... Um, this archetype of this, you know, Navy SEAL pirate, this special operations pirate who is essentially above the law, but above the law for good. Um, and, you know, there are parts, there are, you know, there are parts of that that are true and accurate. There are also parts of his memoir that were completely uh, made up um, and which I have in the book. And, and it, it is a, um, I say an archetype because, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, after the bin Laden raid, the books that have come out about the people involved in the bin Laden raid tell the same kind of story where parts of it are true. And then the parts that they lie and embellish are meant to, to give you a little more bang, bang, so that it'll sell more to make it sexier. Um, right. And there's no fealty to the truth, ultimately. And, you know, the, the problem that Marcinko had at, at his core, which is a problem that the SEAL Team 6 has had, and not not everyone, by the way, not all of these guys is integrity. You know, they have a gaping hole in the integrity. Well, that's uh, why I asked if he wrote that thing, because I thought it was so strange. It's like so ironic, I guess is the word that uh, their slogan is like, my word is my bond and my integrity is the most integrous. Ah, and then they're operating exactly how you're op you're describing, which is, you know, pretty much the opposite. Pirates. Yeah. Yeah, well, as they, we learned, they did not write the Boy Scouts code yeah. that you're referring to. That was somebody else who's cleaning up after. Well, I, you know, I, I think one one thing to keep in mind and, and and for context and for which is is that you know the the bulk of Navy SEALs and the bulk of the majority of the SEALs in SEAL Team Six are not criminals. They are you know by any measure of what they do, professional, you know, patriotic and and very good at what they do. You know, you may not agree with their line of business, um, but they are within their, their, their lawful citizens. 
essentially. Um, but there is a uh, not insignificant number of a uh, core at, in the SEALs and SEAL Team Six who are criminals essentially for the state, and they don't they don't they don't leave it there. Um, it's not just for the state; they do it for themselves as well. And unfortunately, and ironically the ones who are sort of the worst of the worst tend to be the loudest and go public with the most heroics. And so, although Marcinko did not write the Navy SEAL ethos that you're describing, um, several and two of the most prominent authors of the Navy SEAL ethos uh, were involved with war crimes post 9-11 with cover-ups and criminal uh, misconduct, allegations of criminal misconduct. And it is not lost on the SEALs and SEAL Team 6, that these guys were allowed to author um, this, you know, this document, which, you know, as you quoted, the word is my, you know, word is my word is my bond. I mean, I used parts of the ethos uh, as sort of um, subject lines in the, in the book uh, for the book sections, because at some point it becomes, you know, sort of a cruel joke that, you know, you have men whose behavior and units whose behavior runs, you know, absolutely counter to what their supposed creed is. Let's I'm, talk about- I'm curious how, like, it seems like there's this period uh, right after the Iran hostage debacle and 9-11, where, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the Navy SEALs aren't super active. I mean, I don't know if they're how many missions they're running, but at the same time, in pop culture, you have this kind of boom in Navy SEAL stuff. You have the Charlie Sheen movie and a bunch of other movies uh, how did they kind of massage that that uh, pop culture narrative that there are these you know heroes who are constantly saving the day? Well, I mean, you know, they were. The, you're right. Uh, after you know, through the '80s, starting in with Charlie Sheen's film, and then moving forward, there were several. I mean, I think even in um, in Predator, uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, Schwarzenegger might have been a SEAL. I, you know, the, the Jesse Ventura, who was a UDT man. Right. Who was in that? Um, you know, it, it, there was there was more um, public, ex, you know, knowledge and acceptance of the seals as a brand. You know, whereas after Vietnam, it was the Green Berets that sort of came out of you know in pop culture um, as uh, sort of this new shining uh, unit. Um, the seals did have missions. There weren't that many. Seal Team Six had some. They weren't um, partic- They weren't that significant. Um, there just weren't that many. They were considered sort of the 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 JV team in their world of tier one operations. Um, and we need to separate here. My book is largely about SEAL Team 6. SEAL Team 6 takes from the Navy SEALs. So on the one hand, you have this very specific elite unit that's best known for killing Osama bin Laden and is recognized both nationally and internationally as this, you know, one of America's, you know, if not America's, premier military unit, uh, and certainly brand. Um, and then there are the Navy SEALs who are as a larger group, a rank or a tier or two lower, um, in skill and funding. Um, and so, you know, there's an inner it's interchangeable sometimes, but not always the public, you know, what you're asking about in terms of movies and, and literature largely was about the Navy SEALs. And they didn't have a ton of missions. They didn't do, uh, they, they were, you know, they, they were involved in the, uh, the first desert uh, war in Iraq um, against Saddam. They certainly were involved in nearly every conflict, but not in great numbers. Um, after, after Vietnam, they shrunk and then they started to build up again in the late eighties, early nineties, but they, they still were very small. And it isn't until nine 11 when the, when, when the U.S. government, you know, acknowledges essentially to itself, they're going to be two um, concurrent wars going on mm. that they needed to expand, and so um, that's where you get the big bump. And now it's just a huge recruitment drive to bring in and the SEALs and SEAL Team Six. Frankly, the SEALs are the single greatest uh, recruiting tool for the U.S. Navy. Period. Right. That's an important thing to understand. More people go into the U.S. Navy because they think they want to become SEALs. Not that they try out to even be SEALs. I just talked to a SEAL today who said, you know, becoming a SEAL, trying to even get into the program prior to 9-11 was exceedingly difficult, but it was still what recruited men, young men into 
the U.S. Navy. And so there goes your that answers your question why uh, they became uh, part of pop culture because the military pushed it. It was a it's a recruiting tool, you know, yeah, soft, totally. soft, soft propaganda. It's to- the Navy SEALs totally live in this space of like it's a thing that you think is extremely cool when you're like 13 and you have a Zippo lighter and you're throwing knives at your wall and stuff. And, <laughs> uh, but like w- PR, it does kind of play into the story specifically about the about SEAL Team Six though because there's like this closed loop you sort of describe regarding the way that they present themselves uh, as heroic and are are able to shape like stories. Uh, about things that actually went terribly wrong by by reimagining them and, and awarding you know getting themselves awarded like medals of honor and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about like the events that sort of um, you know embody that process or whatever? Yeah, and uh, let me just start by saying that I don't think in many ways the the awards, military awards in general across the board, are frequently given in situations that were nothing short of disasters, right? They were, they were often essentially military uh, fuck-ups. And when you have military fuck-ups, the real question is, is how did it happen and who's responsible? And in the military system, you have officers and enlisted, and the officers are responsible by law. Uh, for good order and discipline and for making decisions. So one of the dynamics that, you know, we see over and over, it happens in every war, it happens with every major award in, in, with these, uh, in these wars, is that you have events, tragic events, where, um, you know, people really made a bunch of bad mistakes. And one of the easiest ways to um, sort of divert any attention towards those who are in charge is to hand out awards and the bigger the award the the greater the diversion so early in uh, the war in afghanistan after 911 uh, the first big battle uh that the seals were involved with was in march of 2002 and it was on a mountaintop called tucker gar uh, later the battle became known as the the battle of uh, roberts ridge and it was it was one of the last efforts um, that the U.S. military was doing to displace and and find and kill uh, what was left of Al Qaeda and Taliban that hadn't already fled after uh, Kabul and Kandahar had had fallen, and and the U.S. had essentially uh, helped take over and, and replace take over the, the country, and um, there was a mission which a group small group of uh, recon a recon unit for SEAL Team Six was sent up. Uh, to a mountaintop, and uh, they basically landed on it with a helicopter on an on an ambush. And the first one of the seals, uh, Neil Roberts, fell out of the back of the helicopter. Um, the helicopter was hit with uh, RPGs and gunfire. Uh, was damaged. They crashed further down the mountain. They eventually were able to evacuate, and then they went about. The small group of seals went about trying to rescue their missing missing man. That led to a chain of events, which included landing again on top of the mountain, uh, this time knowing that they would be ambushed, um, and losing another another guy, uh, John Chapman, who was a Air Force combat controller, um, and that which was controversial in and of itself, and we can get into that later. Um, ultimately, seven American servicemen died on the mountain, and uh, a bunch of awards were given out, Silver Stars. Uh, the the two highest medals were the 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 second highest medal after the Medal of Honor is a service cross. So there was an army, there was a Air Force cross and a Navy cross given out, um, and later they were upgraded to Medals of Honor. Um, when you pull apart what happened up there, what becomes very clear is the officers who were in charge, um, in particular of SEAL Team Six, made a series of disastrous calls. Um, and they, you know, look, the enemy, right. Killed these guys, but they were in a bad position because they were ordered up there violating a a bunch of, you know, very basic rules of reconnaissance, um, that, you know, in theory, a unit like seal team six is supposed to follow. Um, and so instead of looking at what the decisions were that led to this disaster, uh, it was, you know, look, it's a tragic day. All of these Americans died. The first SEAL from SEAL Team 6 died in the war. These guys are heroes. 
let's give them awards uh, and let's call it a day. And there's no repercussions or, or accountability even after the fact. You know, the lessons learned are okay, well, we won't go up on the ambush anymore. But the way lessons need to be taught are officers have to lose their jobs. I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of like account corporate accountability 101. The main uh, thrust of the book, you get in a lot into the corruption in the Navy SEALs that's covered up and, and changed in um, the media's narrative of it. Uh, but the book starts with Roberts Ridge and you use that as kind of a landmark for a shift in the culture of the Navy SEALs where there is a change in corruption. And aside from just like misinformation or bad tactics, what are we talking about when we talk about like, like this is America's premier fighting force? What, what, what kind of incidents are we talking about here? Well, so, you know, I start with Roberts Ridge because what's really important to understand is, is that after 9-11, right, the, the SEALs go in. No, no one had been to war, right? U.S. forces had not been in war. You know, there had been Mogadishu in 93, you know, some small conflicts, but we had not been to war since since Vietnam, right? That's the, in, in terms of this, there had been, uh, obviously the war in Iraq was very fast in, uh, under George H.W. Uh, Bush um, against Saddam. And so what happens is, is that you have this, this particular uh, battle, this particular uh, event on top of uh, Takar Gar, in which there the, the the seal who fell out of the back of the helicopter, uh, Neil Roberts, um, was discovered um, essentially beheaded. They the 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 enemy had tried and, and uh, severed, you know, had decapitated him essentially after he he had died, and the seals in his team all came in and saw the body when his body was recovered at Bagram. And that and and, and the, the losses of that day had a huge psychological effect for a bunch of men who had never been to war. And one of them, one of the, the things that came out of that was this vengeance. There was not not for everyone, by the way. I'm not suggesting that everyone in the unit, but it became part of the, the culture of not just SEAL teams, not just Red Team and Red Squadron, who were the, the subunit that these guys were a part of, but later all of SEAL Team 6, which was, you know, they had this thing called revenge ops. This was this concept, you know, we're going out and we're going to kill these guys that did this to, 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 to Roberts. And this sort of, you know, a bloodlust, really, this hyperviolence. And so the experience of um, a horrific event in, in some of their, you know, the, the first time some of these men really saw war, they had done training all their life. They had, you know, they were the best of the best, but they hadn't seen it, right? They hadn't seen it up close and personal. And this thing stained them psychologically. And some of them responded by saying, you know, in the biblical terms, an eye for an eye, a head for a head. And so the the corruption was that this stuff started happening, the, these, these war crimes, in particular, uh, with SEAL Team 6, we want to be clear about this. Uh, what they did a lot of was um, desecration of the dead. Okay. The, 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 it was, these guys are, um, as a group, um, unbelievable craftsmen and, and skilled tradesmen of their craft. And their craft is killing. Killing up close, killing frequently killing the right people versus the wrong people based on what their intelligence is, based on what the, the as the situation, um, as they assess the situation, that's that's what they're trained to do, right? And they're very, very good at it. Um, and the, what comes down from Roberts Ridge is this uh, retaliatory uh, need, this, you know, it's bloodlust. And so, there was an enormous amount of body desecration and war crimes. They're, they're, it's a criminal act that is, uh, you know, you, you can go to prison, you can go to military uh, jail for five to 20 years, depending on, on what it is. And it's, you know, absolutely frowned upon. There's a Geneva Convention, there's international rules of law and rules of war that are, are basic, right? And they fundamentally violated that uh, every deployment they were on for 20, you know, the better part of, of two decades. And so when I say corruption, the corruption is that, you know, it wasn't that everyone was, were, was committing these crimes, but it's that a, most of the SEALs understood and knew what was going on. The leadership in particular knew what was going on. And in most cases, they did nothing. They hit it. 
They ignored it. Some of them encouraged it. That's the corruption. It's, it's the it's the total lack of integrity on some of the most basic fundamental rules and 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 values. Right, the military. These are the best of the best. We expect them to uh, perform better than anybody else. We also expect of them that they adhere to the rules of law, the rules of war, the laws of war, and basic integrity and morality more than you know your average uh, army private. Right. That's the 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 what came down from uh, Roberts Ridge, and that's why I start the book with Roberts Ridge because there was so much packed into that event. That it's not just out. revenge culture, though, right? I mean, what we're talking about is, I mean, if we're referring to the Navy SEALs, it's canoeing, um, which has multiple purposes because it's a, something that you can do to a dead body that not only mutilates it, but also obscures it. And you can cover, you can essentially cover up a lot of information by doing that. So, uh, yeah, okay. Is so, there anything it, you'd like to say about that? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I and I'm, you know, forgive me, I, I try not to be some of this stuff is very graphic. And so, you know, I don't and, Our listeners know. are freaks. They don't care. No, it's just more like trigger warnings that, you know, look, some, of, so, some of this stuff is 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 pretty horrific. But um, in canoeing, uh, canoeing is a nomenclature or a nickname that uh, became popular and used within SEAL Team 6. Um when a certain kind size of a of a round of a of a bullet um, from a certain distance in uh, usually up close is fired towards the top of a, a person's head or skull, their forehead, and um, it essentially splits open the top of their head, uh, and it leaves a space, a negative space that looks like a canoe. It's a V shape. Okay, um, some of this can happen incidentally in a, in a battle. It's, it's, it's not, um, impossible for it to happen. It has happened. It does happen. Um, what came was when you are clearing a room, okay, you, some, you, you shoot an enemy and they go down. And what you then do is you put in a security round, which is to make sure that they are dead so that you can move forward past them. Right. And, um, that is the, uh, there can be a, a utility and a purpose for firing around into someone who is stationary. What happened was, and what people don't understand is these guys went out on so many missions, not just on, you know, two, three, four, a night. Okay. In which they're going into homes and compounds fighting, you know, the, the proverbial bad guy and they got bored right? That's what happened. These guys were so good at what they did. They basically needed something to keep themselves entertained. Um, and again, I, I want to say this, it's not as if everyone was doing this, but what came about was, were photos. And so what happened was, was that guys inside SEAL Team 6 discovered that these guys were taking essentially a, a crime scene photo you, you take afterwards for uh, identifying the dead uh, and later just sort of showing, you know, the, the, the forensics of what happened. So you can show what you did. And what they found was that these guys were coming back and the photos you'd have, you know, let's say 10 guys who had been killed and eight of them had been canoed. Okay. Um, in a, in a normal setting, right. Incidentally, eight of 10 are not going to be, your shots are not that good, not close enough range. Um, you're not, don't have enough precision, Right. So what became clear was these guys were going around and firing bullets into people's heads because there was going to be a picture of it. And it was an, a form of entertainment for them. It was a form of desecration of the body. It was a calling card in their world that they had been there. Right. And, and these were the photos that they would show at, you know, SEAL Team 6 reunions called the Stump Muster right? Greatest hits, greatest collection, right? And so there was a point in which they, the JSOC and uh, the military instituted some rules without using, without saying explicitly so was meant, in, was intended purposefully to end the canoeing because it was, it's a war crime, right? And it's unnecessary. So that that's an example where it's, it's um, what may start with a military reason quickly morphs into just gratuitous violence. And that, that happened over and over and over, starting from 2002 all the way through, you know, to today. 
Chris Pratt from Zero Dark Thirty did this? I don't believe it. Um, <laughs> as we kind of round out here, I, I have to get a little political, if you'll forgive me, because, uh, you know, as we mentioned off mic, this is a leftist podcast and I can hear uh listeners yelling at their you know ipod or whatever the fuck they listen to this on at me uh zooms so, across america <laughs> yeah and I, being I, dented by screams i feel like i should insert a point of view here a little bit and also i think it does kind of coalesce with uh what's going on near the end of your book too which is you know hey look we all love whistleblowers you know uh we all think it's a good thing to expose corruption and stuff like that about the American war machine. But is the point here to make a better, more accountable murder, death killing machine, or is, you know, do we look at this and we go, yeah, this seems kind of like a natural culture that would occur as a byproduct of this, you know, kind of wholly inhuman thing that is being caused by uh you know political forces underneath the 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 surface of this whole thing so like what what's the goal i guess is what i'm asking your book i mean I, i'm not sure if i really really am a hundred percent on uh you know making sure that the cops are super you know by the book and then but they still uphold a law that is you know wholly destructive and stuff like that the same goes for the military etc well, I mean, I think that there there are multiple levels to that answer. I mean, first, primarily, we're talking about um, accountability, basic accountability, right? I mean, at the end of the day, leaving aside your political viewpoint, you know, whether you're a pacifist or you know a Second Amendment pro military gun nut um, or supporter, doesn't have to be a nut, but um, these are taxpayer these are taxpayer dollars that uh, support US service people wearing uniforms with the American flag on. Whatever they do in, an, in a foreign land is on us collectively, right? And so, you know, the, at the basic part of it is, is if, you, if we're sending our military in to conduct war and operations, there has to be some basis and standard. That is, those are the laws of war, right? They're, they're, they have to be followed. They need to be followed. That's one of the, you know, ways in which we have uh, evolved as as a civilization, as a society. It may not be perfect. It's not, it may not be there yet, but it's one of the ways that we keep ourselves from becoming, uh, you know, reversing back into total lawlessness. Um, so, on the on the one level, there's a basic accountability. I think there is something that most people don't want to accept, and that is that we, um, you know, that you guys know that the the biggest American war movie in U.S. history is American Sniper, and it is a. I, I use this as an example because it's the best example, right? Americans love war films; they love the the story and the myth of the war and leaving aside for a second. And I, I, so I'm going to, I am going to avoid your answer, answering your question slightly by saying, <laughs> leaving aside political affiliation or interest, there is the fact that we buy these myths and they are full of shit. They're, they're, they're filled with mistruths and they do a disservice first to the people that they are about. Right. So at the end of the day, um, seal team six guys in Delta, they sir they saw literally an unprecedented amount of violence and war in our history i don't think people fully get this idea that this was a 20 year war and never before have this many people fought this much war up close and in fact in a sense it's this few people it's this really small group and whether you like them or hate them or like their cause or hate their cause they carry with them an, an enormous burden and that burden is the weight of what they've done. And that is something that we share as a society and, and as a people. That is a shared burden that we have to. So we have to first understand what they actually went through and what was done. You have to hold them accountable. But ultimately, right, it's this is the, I mean, I guess my point is, is that by understanding what happened during the war with this unit, because it is the best known, we can know what the consequences are of a, of a blank check 
that Congress and the pre- and you know consecutive presidents gave um, for the U.S. military to conduct these endless wars, right? And so, you know, from that standpoint, it is very much an anti-war position, right? My hope, honestly, is is that by understanding what the burden is that these guys have to carry and that we share because they did all of these immoral and and illegal things that we're going to think twice about writing that blank check again and preventing us, you know, stopping us from go, you know, understanding and putting pressure whether it's on congress or, you know, our elected officials to not go to war in the future, right? That's I mean, you know, if you're looking for the political angle, that's it, but it start it does start with basic accountability. And the SEALs like, you know, Metropolitan Police, it's a blue wall of silence. And you have to break down that blue blue wall of silence before you can have any hope for for positive change. So you're saying Uh, you're trying to bust the myth and what we do with that information as readers is kind of up to us. Yeah. I mean, I think that, look, I'm I'm an investigative journalist. I think that the more information and more truthful information that is in the public realm is it's the found the basis of our democracy, right? You you need an informed public um, for appropriate and accurate democracy, right? We vote based on the knowledge of what we of what we have, and this is done in our name, right? And and you know if you're anti-war, it's going to prove, of course, that that war is bad, and it is. Um, but if you're pro-war or pro-military, it's really important to understand um, all the costs that come with this kind of war and these kinds of men and these kinds of units. Go go ahead, Energy Epson. No, I was just going to say, I wish we had time to get into the Bin Laden raid because that's another huge myth. uh, And I wanted to note that this will be a good teaser for the for the book because you do go into that. But there's a ton of speeches on YouTube from Robert O'Neill, who is this one of the SEALs who there's kind of an I am Spartacus situation going on where a couple of different guys are saying, I'm the one who shot Bin Laden. I'm the one who shot Bin Laden. Uh, but there's some great YouTube videos of him with a beat red face uh, telling the story. And you can just like viscerally tell that he's lying. Um, but that's a, a big reason people should should read the book is because you do go into what what actually happened and what very much did not happen about that. Right. 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 And 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 to the you know just to round it up, you know, if you go back his book and his story, as well as one of his teammates books and stories are the blueprint was the Marcinko book, Rogue Warrior. Right. It's so, you know, t- history tells us all right. You go back and you find that the unit was created with this DNA um, it built in. And so it's no surprise that 30 years later um, you have the same problem and the same set of events happening again. Rogue Warrior was the name of it. Marcinko's book. That's insane. <laughs> um, what was this book about? We don't have the time. Um, <laughs> damn, I do have a lot, lot of killing. Time. It's a lot um, of killing. I guess I'll have to read the rest of the book. It's about a warrior um, who, in a way, goes rogue. <laughs> Going rogue. I imagine a guy buying it. Ah, I thought this was Road Warrior. Ah, it's happening. <laughs> <advocate. laughs> okay. Well, um, damn. All right. Well, you know what? All right. I'm, I'm good, though. I'm good with your answer. I think that at least uh, whistleblowing and busted myths and all that sort of stuff is definitely part of the thing because, you know, I mean, as, as much as like, we like to read stories about corrupt cops and corrupt military and stuff like that. And go, oh, these guys are such dicks. I hate them so much. Ultimately, the point is we empathize with individuals. The systems are bad, right? So, like, there are a lot of freaking socialists that are socialists because they went to war and stuff and had to do stuff like this. And, uh, you know, the point is not to antagonize somebody for having gone into the military because the military is actively recruiting you know well i mean I, you know the thing I, I make a point of this both at the and in the beginning of the book and in the the epilogue this book is only possible because men from seal team six who were disgusted by the criminality of their unit and then watched how it spread as a virus through the larger military and organization tried their best on the inside as whistleblowers to fix things and they failed and they failed because they were told to shut the to shut up Basically, they were ignored. And so in ultimately they came to a reporter, right? That's the the that's your storyline. But it it's, you know, I, I see those men, frankly, as heroes because they are doing the hardest thing of all. I mean, you know, there's it takes an enormous amount of moral courage to do the right thing, especially when everyone around you is doing the wrong thing, or the ones who are doing the wrong thing are rewarded, right? And so um, you know, I there's 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 something to be, you know. I, 
there's honor and anonymity in that way. And, you know, all of those uh, people who spoke to me and provided information that was both classified and extremely sensitive, uh, you know, I consider to be uh, having done a, you know, very patriotic service to the public. Yeah, I'm uh, struggling to not agree with the word patriotic, but also agree with everything else you said. I, it's leftist podcast, but I'm going to get yelled at by my audience. I'm just kidding. We're branding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Navy SEALs. We have a brand, too. Yeah. I, it's like, I, you know, I, I guess my my point is, is that it's it is that you can be agnostic about the military. Right. You could be you could be absolutely against the military. And I don't know, maybe personally, I'm a pacifist. That doesn't mean that uh, I have any less interest in, you know, understanding um, how the elite part of the military was um, misused. And, you know, so, yes. You empathize with these guys who have this burden. At the same time, you have to call out the people who are responsible for it, right? Which are are the officers, right? And so, you know, if someone is a war criminal, um, that has to be dealt with, and there needs to be accountability to that for that. But the but the real accountability comes from you know dealing with the people who were responsible. Um, and that doesn't ma- it doesn't matter whether that's a police department, a corporate, you know, we live in a world. I mean, look, we live in a world in which the elites in any strata avoid accountability. Right. And at the end of the day, SEAL Team 6 operators are the worker bees. They are the blue collar, uh, you know, uh, lunch pail guys. And it's the officers who are your corporate uh, managers and executives. And they ride these guys um, to great career heights despite the fact that they um, witnessed or helped cover up or looked away from criminal activity, uh, war crimes. And so, you know, you, there's plenty of blame to go around, but I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, aim at, aim towards the top, right? It's the, the elites are, are, that's a problem that we see everywhere in our society. And in that sense, it's no different at SEAL Team 6. Yeah, totally. I mean, I guess I'm looking big, big. Well, th- I mean, this also happens with like socialist discourse too. You know, we individualize uh, even like elites within the fucking you know capitalist private market and go like, oh, I hate Jeff Bezos or whatever. And you know, I do, but but uh, I guess my brain just keeps going bigger, bigger, bigger picture here, where I'm like, this is all moving in the right direction. But I will cut myself off because I do think that your book does actually fuel the discourse in that direction right uh, knowing about all this stuff is plenty to get you looking at uh you know why 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 is the war machine even doing what it's doing uh and and why does it need to cover its own tracks and etc so uh we will exit the uh the 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 debate zone or whatever we're in right now and uh let's do some plugs where can my listeners find you where can they read the book uh etc well the book is of course um at every great bookstore that exists in this country um especially the online one uh the world the world wide (laughs) web has it anywhere at barnes and noble at amazon um you can find my work uh at the intercept where i'm an investigative reporter focused mostly on on uh national security uh endeavors um and yeah you know google is a is a powerful drug that it is okay our plugs now uh hi i'm jake you've been listening to me the whole podcast don't know why i reintroduced myself i have shows uh what do i have coming up i have a show on rushticks.com that's online so you can watch it from anywhere uh all my uh, dates are in my pin tweet and on my website uh that's on february 24th which is next week and uh what else do i have i'm going on tour with eve six the stuff is selling out we have all already almost sold out comet ping pong pizza a place we are really playing twice two night residency so if you're in dc you gotta get on top of that and get tickets um i think that's most of what i have going on this is my other podcast why you mad and uh i think that's it Okay, I'm uh, uh, here. I have shows as well. You can come see my shows. Uh, thank you for coming to Paid Protest. If you came out last night, it was a hot room. Big success. High five, everybody. Uh, we're going to do another one March 18th at the Secret Loft at 8 p.m. So be sure to check out that one as well. And you can find me on Twitter at Patek 
Test Kitchen. That's P-T-A-K. Test Kitchen, your one-stop shop for exciting new flavors. I am at Anders Lee here on Twitter. There's one Instagram. Check out Redacted tonight. And uh, also, if you're in D.C., um, next Saturday, the 27th, I believe that's the Saturday, February 27th at 6.30, I will be on uh, the stand-up for Julian Assange show, hosted by the great Randy Credico at the Tabard Inn. Uh, got a lot. Of, there are going to be a lot of great guests, um, including Marianne Williamson. Holy shit! Cool. Yeah, Marianne is going to be doing a drop-in uh, set. I guess I don't know, but uh, show us some pictures of birds. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Uh, so come hang out at that six thirty Tabard in Feb twenty seven. It's. I can't stop.